Welcome everybody to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. If you're joining us for the first time, especially warm welcome to you. And whether you're joining us for the first time or not, can I please encourage you to click that subscribe button and also pass this video on to friends and family and anybody else who you may think might be interested. Now, as you all know, the Coalition for Marriage uh, represents people of all faith backgrounds and indeed none. And the thing that ties us all together is our support and promotion of one man, one woman marriage. It's a privilege to have with us this morning uh, Simon Calvert from the Christian Institute. What we're going to talk about is this issue of so-called gay conversion therapy and why, if any, there's a threat to believers in real marriage, one man, one woman marriage, from uh, the ban of so-called conversion therapy. So first of all, welcome Simon. Would you like to say hi to our viewers? Yeah, hello, and thank you for inviting me to, uh, to be with you today. First of all, I wonder if we could start, could you tell us what is uh, conversion therapy? So it's an umbrella term that's been chosen by activists who are campaigning on this issue. And when it first really started to come into the public conscious, it was pretty clear that what they were referring to were practices, mainly things that sort of consigned to the history books, where gay people were victims of abusive or just dangerous therapies. There will be people with stories about how in the 60s uh, they were subjected to electroshock therapy because they were in uh, homosexual relationships. Uh, now, thankfully, we learned that this is wrong and dangerous and damaging and we shouldn't do it to anybody. Some people also have horrid stories to tell of something called, I'm afraid, corrective rape. There have been some verified examples of this coming out of South Africa, for example. The worst possible kind of abuse, I mean, highly criminal. That was the starting point. That's what we thought that we were talking about when people say conversion therapy. And that means that, you know, hundred percent of people would say if any of these practices are, are still legal and anyone is, is still being subjected to them, whether gay or otherwise, then, you know, clearly the law it should step in. But what's happened since then is the activists have become a lot more upfront about the fact that that's not the only thing they want to tackle. In fact, very much at the center of the bullseye for many of these activists is the ordinary work of churches. Now, as you say, Coalition for Marriage supporters come from a range of backgrounds, but they would perhaps acknowledge that speaking up for marriage, the Christian church in the UK is one of the leading, if not, if not the leading voice. So you can see how a law which targets those churches precisely because of their beliefs about marriage, you know, should be of concern to, to anyone who cares about the true definition of marriage. And so what we are seeing is uh, activists being interviewed in the news, producing documentaries on Netflix, being allowed to kind of tell their stories unchallenged. And they're suggesting that the very act of teaching somebody within a church that um, sex is only for marriage and marriage is only between a man, a man and a woman is somehow abusive and harmful and that the law, the criminal law, should step in. So that's what we're talking about. So it's a very serious business. Thank you, Simon. Can I uh, just confirm? So in terms of those awful practices that you referred to, they're already illegal in our country, aren't they? And are there examples of, of, of that kind of bad behaviour taking place en masse such that we need to deal with it legally? In terms of the evidence base for this, um, you have people's stories reported in the press, but of course it's very hard to, to, to verify those. There is a group called the Ozan Foundation, led by Jane Ozan, who's really the leading campaigner for a conversion therapy ban. You know, there are all sorts of problems with the Ozan Foundation survey, even though it, it gets touted as if it's, you know, solid evidence. The, the UK government did a survey of gay people and they asked the question about whether they had been subject to conversion therapy, but they didn't define it. So all this kind of confusion really lends to the concern, certainly that we have at the Christian Institute, about protecting people, gay or otherwise, from abuse of any kind. Legitimate concerns are being exploited by people to try to silence Christian churches that teach the Christian sexual ethic, or indeed that pray with people. I mean, you'd be shocked, Tony, that the number of conversion therapy activists who will go on record as saying, you know, my experience of conversion therapy was praying with my friends, and that should be made illegal. And how far has that gone in other countries? Are you aware of anything? Take Australia, for example. 
the state of Victoria, they have a conversion therapy ban which expressly says in the wording of the statute that it includes prayer as one of the prohibited activities. We are in contact with people in Australia who are quite clear this ban, when it comes into force, it's been passed but it's not in force yet, is going to be used against churches. There will be people who will make complaints against churches for the way that they pray. And it's going to be fascinating and really, frankly, horrifying to see, you know, how that pans out. As a society, we, we generally promote counselling. We promote talking therapies for people who have all sorts of difficulties and challenges with their, their lives or their lifestyles. And it, it's generally seen as a good idea. Uh, doesn't it make sense that if somebody wants help with any aspect of their sexuality and they freely seek that help, that they should freely be able to avail themselves of it? Whatever uh, the government agrees that it will or won't do as pertains to, to, to therapists, it should never reach into the everyday life of churches. You can't have a situation where a law that's meant to be about protecting people from abuse is being invoked on a daily basis against churches who are simply, you know, teaching the, the Christian sexual ethic, uh, you know, pastoring their congregation, praying with people. Christians asking their friends to pray with them about resisting temptation is pretty mainstream. And Christians do it for all kinds of reasons, you know, all kinds of other temptations that they face. But can you imagine a scenario where five years later, that person has completely rejected the Christian faith and he revisits those prayer meetings that he used to have with his friend and he says to the authorities, to the police, I was subject to conversion therapy. Is it right that that person who prayed with his friend, who asked him to pray with him, should then find himself being convicted for conversion therapy for doing that? I think most people would think, that that's outrageous. But this, I'm afraid, is the kind of scenario that, that we're concerned about if activists get their way. Simon, are there examples of people who would say that they've, they've benefited from receiving counselling of this nature? We're talking about um, people who, who are benefiting from the ministry of our churches and you know th there are certainly people for whom same-sex temptation is, is the issue. But you know one of the problems with, with all of this is that um, same-sex temptation kind of gets put on a pedestal. It kind of gets treated as, as if it's a thing on its own, and it's not. Those of us who call ourselves followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we face struggles and pressures and temptations of, of all kinds, and we need one another, and we need our churches to support us. That is the standard Christian experience. We shouldn't bring in a law, a criminal law, which sort of cuts a line through that experience and says, ah, yes, but if you're talking about people facing same-sex temptation, that's not allowed. We, we, we can't have that. And I want to say that in terms of its public pronouncements, the, the UK government, the Westminster government, um, appears to understand this. They seem to recognise that they, they can't legislate in the way that the activists want. Uh, there's going to be a, a government consultation in September where we'll hopefully see the details of their proposals. We're also going to have to see what Parliament does with this legislation as it progresses through Parliament. As uh, your organisation, Christian Institute, you've got a lot of interaction with a lot of churches, are people uh, receptive of the urgency of the issue? Are people realising the need to support defending Christian values and views? Uh, or are they giving in to the culture as in uh, so many other areas of society? There certainly are many churches, many church leaders, many congregations who do recognise that the problems that an excessively broad conversion therapy ban could take, they do recognise the, the importance of maintaining freedom uh, for Christians to be able to live out their faith in their churches and in their homes and, and in the public square. I think that there are also many churches who feel the pressure of society, they feel the cultural pressure, and I think sometimes we can give in to the temptation to go quiet. People might not like what we believe about sexual ethics, it might not be fashionable, but it's our belief and we hold it with no animus towards anybody and it's a belief which is protected by the law. If Westminster or the Stormont administration in Northern Ireland, if they were to go ahead with bans which really do result in church leaders being prosecuted for the way they preach or pastor people, if it really did result in people being prosecuted for praying with their friends, that law would be open to challenge in the courts if they do go down the wrong path with this ban, 
we would be prepared to litigate to seek to have the ban struck down. And I think it's fair to add uh, Wales to your list of administrations that want to enact their own conversion therapy bans. They do, but uh, it's not currently uh, devolved to Wales. So at the moment, uh, the expectation is that Westminster will legislate for England, Wales and Scotland uh, and that the Stormont legis uh, legislature will, will, will legislate there. Uh, will this apply to children? If that law can be interpreted in a way which means that a Christian parent inculcating the Christian faith in their child could be accused of conversion therapy, that is very serious. You know, the state can't intervene in that relationship between a parent and child to stop them passing on a Christian faith to their children. And presumably that would apply to Sunday schools and all sorts of activities with children. Well, that would be a concern, wouldn't it? That uh, a badly worded conversion therapy ban could result in complaints being made against church youth work if in the context of that youth work, they, they teach the Christian sexual ethic. For those uh, of, of our supporters who maybe don't have a faith uh, or have a different faith, but still support uh, one man, one woman marriage as the, the stabilising bedrock of society, do you think it matters to them or should they just ignore the whole thing? You know, I hope that people who, who don't share our faith would still be willing to stand with us uh, and stand for our freedom. Not our freedom to be beastly to gay people, that's not what we're talking about. I hope I've been pretty clear about that. It's our freedom simply to explain to people what we believe about sexual ethics. It's our freedom to teach that in our churches. It's the freedom to, to pray with people who ask for prayer. Uh, and yes, it's the freedom of, of parents to be able to pass along the Christian faith to their children as well. These are the freedoms that we're talking about. And that's the thing, isn't it? You touched on the, the key issue there, which is individual freedom for everybody in a free society to believe and act as they want to, as long as it doesn't impact other people. What can we do actively as individuals? What do you think we should do in response to this? Do take opportunities to speak up, you know, in the comments columns below your favourite news website or whatever, you know, kind of sensible, measured comments there can just help to influence how people perceive these things. Do look out for the Westminster government's consultation on this issue, which they say will be issued in September. People will have an opportunity to respond to that consultation. Great. Well, Simon, I uh, understand the issue better. I'm very grateful for your work. I'm very grateful for the work with the Christian Institute, which I might add uh, doesn't just uh, protect the freedom of Christians, but in doing so protects the freedoms of everyone nationally. So thank you for your work. Thank you for the organisation's work. Thank you for your time with us today. Simon, it's been lovely to talk to you. Tony, it's been great to talk to you and thank you for your great work at C4M. Thanks, Simon.